Good evening, you're watching Estuary TV News. Coming up, a census on an unprecedented scale, a fish count at the deep. The undead walk abroad in Hull, the city's most haunted house, and I'll be welcoming Jamie Moore and Mike Watt of the tribute band Badness into the House of Fun. Welcome to Estuary TV News. I'm Hugh Richards. First of all, it's over to Richard Morris for the news headlines. Hello there. The City of Culture team has appointed its latest recruit, Phil Batty, a 25-year-old entrepreneur from Hull who set up a business at the age of 16 in the city, has been appointed as the new Director for Education, Skills and Legacy. He'll focus on school cooperation with the City of Culture campaign and Legacy. Phil explained what the most important part of his role is. I think a key part of the work is working with children and young people and schools are a great beacon for that and um, we've got these world-class facilities at the centre of every community and really in terms of 2017 we want to use these buildings as outposts so that we can engage with the community, engage with parents and just build an education programme that inspires young people. Recently, both Lincolnshire and Humberside Police have seen increases in the amount of bogus callers both over the phone and in person. The forces are reminding people to not give out personal information or to allow dodgy traders across their doorsteps. East Riding of Yorkshire Council have given out a rather unusual award. Margaret Cattle, seen here with her award, was given the special badge and a bottle of champagne to celebrate exactly 43 years of helping children cross the same stretch of road at Southwood Road in Cottingham. She originally started started her job in 1972, sharing the role with a neighbour in order to pay for driving lessons. After passing her test, she liked the job so much, she kept with it. A community centre in Hull is celebrating after being handed a £10,000 grant. The Endike Community Care Centre was given the grant yesterday by Stephen Brady, the leader of Hull City Council. The money will go towards buying a new minibus to help transport people to the centre. They actually keep uh, society going in a way, um, the voluntary sector, and they do t such a tremendous job, but don't shout loud really, they just get on with it, they've got work to do every day, uh, and it's just a lovely atmosphere, so it's, you know, I'm really pleased to be able to help them, um, you know, fund uh, a minibus to be able to uh, go and pick a lot of these uh, people up. That's all from me and I'll be back with more news soon. Bye for now. Thank you, Richard. The deep in Hull is still reported to be the world's only submarium. As part of its duties in caring for marine life, it must perform an unfathomable task. The deep is counting every fish in its tanks. Richard Morris dipped his toe in the water. I'm here at the deep in Hull where they're doing something which some people may classify as completely impossible. They have to count every single animal in their collection. The annual census at the deep is a huge undertaking requiring hundreds of man hours just to keep track of the amount of fish in the submarium. March sees the annual beginning of the project. It's a massive project full stop. Every once a year we as a team we have obviously all our displays, we look after each one individually, but we need to make sure we know exactly how many animals are in that display. So as I say, once a year, our task is to count them all. Um, now, for some species, that's pretty easy. If it was penguins, for example, or sawfish, um, we only have a few of those, so it's easy to count. Not so easy are the keepers who have some of these larger exhibits like this one behind me, where we have yellow tangs and chromus. Chromus number over hundreds so counting them can be quite a challenge. With so many fish of different varieties all swimming around at the same time, how is it possible to get an accurate figure? Yeah, we have a cunning plan to count them. And we'd, we actually count them several times and take an average. But we use a team of us. So, so for example, if we were counting in this tank, we were counting the tanks. Um, the team of us, we'd say, three, two, one, go. And we'd all take it to turns from a different view into the tank and count that way. Uh, then we take an average of that several times. The other trick we have up our sleeves is we can also take a photo or do a little bit of filming and that helps too because we can slow it down and look at it more accurately afterwards. Um, but unfortunately it's never quite too accurate so we still need our eyes to count as well. 
The Deep has just completed their annual census, and so as part of their government-issued zoo licence, must now store their counts as part of their database. We have um, very detailed records that go back to the year when we opened um, that have all the information on all the displays and the number of animals and species that are in those displays. You're watching Estuary TV News. A little later, we hear from some more estuarine dialect in What You Say, and Dan Kemp will bring you all the sports news. I'm joined now by Jamie Moore and Mike Watts of the Madness tribute band Badness. Gentlemen, thank you both very much for coming in. Pleasure, sir. Hi. Pleasure. Badness. Um, it, it's not true, of course, because you're not bad. I've seen you, and it's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. It is quite mad, though. Mm -hmm. um, you're, where are you based? Uh, we're based in Hull. Um, been, um, well, it's in our 21st year now as a professional band. And, um, <clears throat> but I say, coming from Hull, but we, we travel all over the UK, Europe. Uh, and everywhere really, whoever wants to say, book us to play, you know, that's where we'll travel to. It's t 25 years you've been a tribute band, it's what, a good 10 years or so before that, that Madness, the original Madness became so popular. Uh, God, we're all getting on a bit, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I remember watching that in the early 80s and Suggs looked like, was, was childlike, an innocent child he looked like. That's with his, right. With, about his, with his oversized hat on. About 18 years old and that, but um, I think that's what it's all based around, you know, like you say, you know, in our teenage years when it when it was there and it was, it's you know, the whole show's kind of based around, you know, like the, the memories that we had when we was younger. And obviously we get to relive that every night when, when we perform. And um, hopefully bring it back for a few people who's watching this as well. Yeah. Well, it's not just that. I mean, we all, well, those of us over, I don't know, over 40, will have a, have a, a sort of, you know, teenage memories of the 1980s. And any music that we remember with that, with that first snog in the gym, it's always going to bring back <laughs> happy, happy <laughs> memories, isn't it? But in the case of Madness, oh. it's also, I mean, what is it? It's, it's just wonderful music, isn't it? There's a lot of 80s music that hasn't survived, but that, this ska music is just, is always going to make you happy. Well, there's, yeah, there is that to it, and there's a massive revival on it these days. You know, there's a lot of younger people sort of getting into that, that sort of group, if you if you like. It is infectious kind of music, you know. Not only the the madness, but the whole sort of two tone ska. You know, with bands like the, the Selector and the Beat and Bad Manners, the Specials. You know, um, you can't help but tap your feet and bounce along to it. You know, uh, and we see that night in night out. You see, even with um, you know, like like Jamie said, like youngsters and um, and even sort of people a bit older than what we are, really, you know, and they're sort of moving about and, you know, and I think that's what sort of gives it the energy that, that, that people sort of want, you know, when they go out for a, for a night out kind of thing. Well, what sort of audiences do you get? I mean, is it, is it just the people who are young when, when Madness was young or is it, is it uh, uh, different generations and new people coming to this music? Sure. Uh, well, it, it varies, doesn't it, from night to night, you know, we, we can play like, um, for instance, to like a, a, a scooter, scooter rally, um, which is, you know, full of a lot of sort of skinheads and sort of bikers and this type of thing. Um, and then the next night we'll be playing sort of a Warner break for, for older people, but their their reaction's just as mad really, because yeah. it kind of, you know, it takes them back. And we adapt the show to sort of cater for whatever sort of audience is in front of us kind of thing, so that works quite well. This is your living, of course. This is how you, you put bread on the table. Do, do you ever get sick of Madness's music? Um, not really, because I think I think we we mess about with it a lot. We, yeah. we kind of change words and odd things happen. We can hold a song up with us being a completely live band. You see, we can hold a song up, and Mike can go off on one and sing something that we no idea what he's going to sing. So we just kind of follow him on instinct. You know, we've got the the memory to actually do it, but uh, it, it causes quite. A I think it's bit easy fun, to. It's easy to think, you know, you could get, um, you know, a bit sort of blase and you're doing it every night and that and it gets a bit stale. But because we enjoy it that much and it's the whole show's kind of based around enjoyment uh, and having a laugh, basically, it's different every night. So it makes it, it just keeps going on and on and makes it, you know, different shows from night to night, even though it's the same show, if you see what I mean. Everyone's a unique performance, isn't That's it? That's right. Kind yeah. of, yeah. It's a bit like a pantomime, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so it's different every night. It's behind you. Yeah. <laughs> But I think I think once we stop getting that buzz as you walk out onto the stage, then you know, then I think it's time to to give up really. But we st I still get the same buzz I got twenty have, years ago. Have you know. ever had any contact from members of the original Madness band? Um, not not directly. Not We've had um, they, they are aware of us. Um, obviously, the tribute scene, you know, it's it's quite big at the moment. Um, 
But um, as far as, you know, like like Bad Manners and the, the specials, we obviously met two or three of them lads and that. And um, But as far as madness, I have... Um, I think your lawsuit's in the post now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You wouldn't want to risk it. Suggs has a way of saying, you know, well, I wish we could do it as well as you could. <laughs> Gentlemen, please don't go away. We'll come back and talk no about problem. some of your upcoming uh, dates in a moment or two. It's a rarely seen part of Hull City Centre, hidden out of sight and out of mind, which is typical of the Anderson Building's reputation. The building, one of only two in Britain to feature stables on the first floor, has a remarkably dark past, and some of its history can still be seen, as Dave Nunn discovers. The Anderson Building in Hull is a hidden piece of history, tucked away right near the city centre. The building has become famous for its history, including its first floor stables, but mainly because it holds the title of Hull's most haunted building, due to a dark past. Well, the location that the building was built on was actually the North Block House, which was part of the fortifications on the eastern side of the River Hull that was set up by Henry VIII. Um, it was during the period between the 1500s and 1600s that a number of Catholics were housed in the Block House and just left to die, basically. Uh, at one point in the 1600s, a, a soldier walked into the, the Block House with a, a lit match by accident and blew the building up and killed himself and several other people. Um, this building was built in 1876 after the, the Great Fire of Witham um, to kind of amalgamate all the different business interests of the Anison family. Uh, and through the years, there's been a number of people come through here. But there's also been a number of deaths on location, including Mr. Anison himself, who died in January 1891. And of course, the building also has links to the murder of Mary Jane Langley, uh, who was also murdered in 1891. The building itself has an eerie feeling to it, like something's not quite right. And although nothing happened while I was there, people have seen and heard everything. From pairs of ethereal legs dangling from roofs, loud bangs are always come in threes, and heard ghostly and demonic voices. Mary seems to be the most active, followed by an unusual ghost that haunts the stables. Um, people have heard uh, Mary Jane Langley's voice on several occasions. Um, one of the interesting ones for me is that a little girl's been spotted, uh, she's been heard, she's been seen, uh, and that fits in with the description of Sarah Anison, uh, who died when she was just nine years old. Certainly, I've, in this room, people have been pushed around, which is quite interesting, as during the war, when the, the air raid sirens were going off, one of the horses bolted and actually killed himself in this very room. And we think what people are encountering is the spirit of this horse running around, nudging into people. Mike says that the various reports from different groups and people confirming the same activity can't be a coincidence, but it encourages sceptics of paranormal beliefs to come down and see it for themselves. Oh, certainly, yeah. We have, we have brought people around um, that don't believe. Um, I brought a friend of mine recently who, who is very sceptical, came in the building, heard three loud bangs and is, is a firm believer that there is something here. So they're more than welcome to come and have a look around and hopefully experience something themselves. Jamie Moore and Mike Watts of Badness are still with me. <coughs> Gents, this tribute scene, it's a, a really big, isn't it? There are, it's, a, it's become a sort of whole secondary industry, hasn't it? Definitely, yeah. Um, I mean, for the past sort of 20, 25 years, um, it's, it's, it's bigger than what a lot of people sort of think, really, to be honest with you. You know, uh, I mean, some bands filling out stadiums, Beyond Again, you know, to, to, to name one. Um, but it goes right down the line, you see. And I think just people want to sort of... Um, nostalgia is a, a big thing for, for, for people, I think. Um, you know, and especially with bands that they can't sort of see that are maybe no longer together now. They can go see a band to sort of relive that. Um, and obviously, you know, in our case, obviously Madness is still going, but, it, it, you know, still found it as popular as what, you know, people going to see them, you see, they want to come and see us, um, you know, whenever they can. And, and are there other are there, are there, um, Madness tribute bands? There's about four or five of them, I think, isn't there? Mm, yeah. yeah. You, quite, going down the country. Few, you, know, you, don't, um, you don't carve the country up into regions. And it's, you, you, no, you, you, no we sometimes go into en enemy territory now. And yeah, yeah you know, and people... Sort of certain bands have their own sort of um, you know favourite areas where they're popular and that, but you, you know I mean we're all kind of adult about it and it's you know it's the business we're in and um, we all we all work. You're like, definitely you know. a pair of Yorkshiremen and yet Madness is very much a London band. It's very <laughs> you know when our house in the middle of our street is in the middle of a London street, how do you get away with being uh, being northern northern mad? Um, well, b being the kind of the singer and the front man, obviously I'm the one speaking to the audience most. And um, I think people find it a novelty, actually. Yeah, <laughs> you know, obviously you, you do the songs and you, you have to sort of sing the songs with that sort of slight tinge of North London accent. You yeah. Know? Um, but when the song finishes, um, you know, this sort of northern voice comes in and people are sort of taken aback. But I think they sort of appreciate it and 
sort of accent, and it, it makes it different, you know, because we don't, you know, we don't want to sort of be madness because you can go see madness. We don't dress up, sort of put wigs. No, on. Yeah, but like, you know, appreciate don't. the music, but it's it's um, um, especially down in London in the south when this sort of northern accent comes through. You know, I think they find it a bit of a novelty, really. And, it's that um, sort of ch cheeky Cockney Sparrow goes, yeah, goes, yeah. comes, yeah, yeah, comes yeah. back from Harvard. <laughs> sounds, that's good. Now, you uh, you record as well, don't you? Where can people get hand, their hands on your uh, CDs? Yeah, we've got... Um, uh, at the moment, they're available just at gigs, actually. Um, but within the next month or so, um, wheels are in process to, um, to make available online through the website. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's, it's just at gigs that, um, that you can pick up a CD. And you've got local gigs coming up. That by local, I mean our broadcast area, yeah. um, East Yorkshire, Northern Lincolnshire. Oh, two in Grimsby. A couple in Grimsby at the Easter weekend. That's a really good Friday. Um, we were at the uh, the County Hotel in Grimsby, and um, then on Easter Sunday we're playing at the uh, the infamous uh, the Bird's Eye Club over here. So um, the infamous Bird's Eye Club. Yeah, you know it's. Um, okay. It's, it's good though because it, it, it's nice to play in the region. You know, we're playing Hull. We'll play on the South Bank. Um, you know, it, it's nice because a lot of you know friends and family can come and see us. There's, you know, obviously we're travelling away on, into Europe and the UK a lot. Um, and of course, you know, the most we can be in bed early nowadays. You know, <laughs> our cock on, our slippers on. Can't that's, yes. that's the true rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you, you've also got a whole new sort of avenue of uh, performance opening up on uh, at sea. Mm. Yeah, yeah, next next month. We well, sort of last year we've been doing a, a few sort of mini cruises for P and L. And uh, they've booked us onto the brand new ship that was launched recently. Yeah. Uh, the Britannia, so they're flying us out to Portugal. Various places. places we've got, we've got, about, we've got about five or six um, cruises with the Britannia this year to the Azores and Gibraltar, um, Portugal, France. You it's, know, it's, it's, it's a rough life you lead, it is, yeah. Well, someone's got to do it, thank, I suppose. You know. Thank you both very much for coming no in. Problem. I hope you enjoy that work. All right, Appreciate thank you. it. Time now for further linguistic explorations around Yorkshire and Lincolnshire in What You Say. Give us something. Give us a croggy. I don't know well, I'm that. not going to give you a croggy if it's a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. No, we got me there. Never heard of it. Yes, I haven't heard it before. A croggy. A pint? I haven't got a clue. Give us a crocky. I don't know. Oh, a pack on a BMX. You know, like stump pegs. Uh, James Dunn joins me now to tell us about the local business in local government this week. James, as usual, the same issues coming up as, as we hear often about, about what's going on. Yeah, I mean, th there are the same issues, but I mean, one I did want to point out actually, I usually pick one every week. So um, this is uh, at the, sorry, the uh, uh, North East Lincolnshire Council. They're going to be, they're going to be meeting quite soon. And what they're talking about is licensing. Now, obviously licensing is how they, uh, how they give premises, pubs and, and such like their, their licenses to operate. But they're talking about introducing something called cumulative impact zones. Now this issue of, of drinking in, in certain areas comes up time and time again. So we've heard people like Martin Vickers, uh, MP for Cleethorpes talk about it, Matthew Groves talked about it. I remember one night actually going out with uh, Martin Vickers, Matthew Groves and the Sunday Times writer A.A. A. Gill. And, uh, Sounds he, like a good bunch. Well, it was a certainly an interesting night out. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he wrote a, you know, a, a, a section on it in the Sunday Times, which, which was controversial. What North East Lincolnshire Council are actually proposing to do something about it now because I think a lot of councils feel quite powerless to do anything about this. And the, uh, about people just getting drunk at night yeah, and, 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 you know, and causing, causing the problems with the police, yes. uh, the, the, the NHS. Um, so th they're talking about these cumulative impact zones. What's that actually going to be essentially doing, as I understand it, is battening down the hatches and saying that from now on, if, licenses, if, if people want to apply for licences in three key areas, so that's Freeman Street, Grimsby Town Centre and Cleethorpes Town Centre, you can look online if you want to find out those exact areas, then they're going to have to prove that, that there's not going to be a cumulative negative impact on the area. So basically, if the addition of their pub or club could be part of a cumulative negative impact 
on you know drinking in that area and you know commission of crime then they're not going to be allowed a license that's going to be difficult i can see how that might work in freeman street or even central grimsby but in a place like Keithorpes, uh, that uh, the economy in the summer is based on yeah. entertainment and hospitality and uh, people going there on holiday and having a good night out. And, I mean, I think that probably their argument would be that there's already enough places. So if you want to apply for a new licence, I think what they're trying to say is we've got enough here, we don't need any more because it becomes more and more of a problem. But I'm just interested to see how that plays out with regards to government legislation. Because I know, for example, if you want to apply for a, a new home to be built, you can't simply say there are enough homes here already. Well, you know? quite. Uh, yeah. And so um, I, I, I'm interested to know and, how they and, can... And boozers are businesses yeah, as well, a, like Exactly. Other. I mean, how, uh, how can you tell a business, uh, we've got enough of these here, we don't want any more? You know, well, surely it's to be uh, governed by, by uh, market values. James, fascinating as always. Thank you very much. Thanks. Time now for the sport with Dan Kemp. North Ferry United won 2-0 at home to Staleybridge Celtic yesterday. Tom Denton and Danny Clark both netted as they try to improve their league form, which seems to have suffered as a result of their cup run in the FA Trophy, which takes them to Wembley at the end of the month. It's been reported that Wigan want to extend their loan of Hull City's Harry Maguire until the end of the season. The £2.5 million defenders only had a few minutes game time for Premier League side, but the Championship club Wigan seem keen to keep the hold of him a little longer. In rugby, Hull FC's Mickey Payer has been given a one-match ban for raising his knees during a tackle against the Leeds Rhinos at the weekend. It will add to the Black and White's front row injury crisis as they face Wigan on Friday. Meanwhile, at Hull KR, an injury has forced 30-year-old Nick Wayman to uh, early retirement. The Australian had hoped to return after knee surgery, but he's now announced he won't be able to come back. The prop hasn't played this season after picking up an injury in a pre-season match against the Warrington Wolves. And finally, Hull Stingrays clinched a close 5-4 win in a tense match against the Edinburgh Capitals that went to penalties. Player coach Carl Lozon has lauded his injury hit squad's mental strength in securing a tough fought victory. They were missing three players, including captain Matty Davis and assistant Zach Avato and Jan Tergot. That's all from me until tomorrow. You can contact us as usual on 01472 31553. Search us on Facebook or Twitter at estuary.tv or by emailing sport at estuary.tv. Bye for now. Thank you very much, Dan. That's all we have time for this time, I'm afraid. If you have a story, please go to our Facebook or Twitter pages. Details are on the screen. Email news at estuary.tv or phone Grimsby 31553. My thanks to my guests from Badness on today's programme. And until tomorrow, good evening. Welcome to Estuary TV's weather. Dry for much of Thursday but rather cloudy. Southerly winds strengthening again later with rain arriving during the evening and a maximum temperature of 11 degrees. Overcast and wet on Friday with hill fog and some light winds.